um, again, thanks for the organizers. And it's really difficult because I want to share with you some really frustrating experiences, um, if not to say nightmares that we have. And uh, when I say we, um, these are two doctoral students, Anna Miguela and Alana Hahn, who did all the work and sort of had to <laughs> regulate their frustration when we started um, to work or when they started to work on their PhD thesis. Um, well, no, this doesn't work. That was not work. Okay, then I have to. Yeah, it's not working. Sorry. Sometimes you have to click. Did you put in the. Um, yeah, it's here. Or is it on the. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So what I would like to do is um, to share with you um, two case examples. Um, basically what I mean with case examples, series of studies where we, in the first part, try to study how implicit expectations might be modulated by explicit expectations. And in part two, this is basically a series of pilot studies that we did in adults in our endeavor to sort of design a setup where we can experimentally test placebo and nocebo effects in youth. And I want to illustrate how we analyze step-by-step -step possible reasons of why it didn't work as intended and how we try to resolve the problems. So I start with the first part where we really set out for studying the interaction between implicit an explicit expectation when inducing the placebo effect. In most studies thus far, um, basically a between subject design was used. For example, one group um, received conditioning alone, one group verbal suggestion, and we had a combination or a natural history. Often in these conditioning studies, instructive conditioning was used. This means that the participants were basically told what to expect. And in most of the conditioning studies, um, there was not a clinical device used, but mostly some lab equipment like electrical wires and so on to induce the placebo effect. What we try to do is use a within subject design. And we tried to first implicitly condition the placebo response and then test whether an explicit instruction of what to expect when our device is turned on changes the placebo effect compared to a group that did not receive any additional instruction. So what we did was we first came up with the idea we wanted to use a clinical device that we can also then later use in patients. So we use a real TENS device, this is the TENS machine, that was manipulated so that it did not really actually function, but the display was um, lightening up. So it looked very real. And um, here's a tense electrode and we use heat stimuli uh, to induce pain. So in the first experiment, we presented the participants a green fixation cross on the monitor. And this fixation cross functioning as a condition stimulus was paired with a low intensity pain stimulus, deep pain stimulus. And then we also had a white fixation cross and this white fixation cross was paired with tense device is not on. We had 100% contingency and this is the tense display. So whenever here the green cross was presented, the display lightened up. So the participant was led to believe well the tense device is now functioning and well what would happen we didn't really tell people because what we tried to do is we first calibrated the heat intensity stimulus so that we had a subjective pain intensity of two five and eight then we had an implicit instruction and then followed the classical conditioning so we had the green fixation cross tense goes on with a pain intensity of two and um, a white fixation cross 
with pain intensity in A. And then one group received explicit instructions. So they were told if the tense is on, if you see the, the green cross, then you should receive, then you should experience pain relief. And then we had a test phase. So what did we tell subjects? We wanted to really, um, well, induce implicit conditioning, which means that we didn't really want to instruct participants of what to expect. So this is how we explained the tense device. We explained that it uh, will send out electromagnetic impulses, that these are similar to MRI, so we don't really feel them. And then we, what's most important is we, we very unspecifically told people we are interested in finding out how such electromagnetic impulses might have an effect on somatic sensation. So we didn't even mention pain sensations. So we again explained when the device is turned on, a green fixation process is displayed and the fixation process signals that a heat stimulus will follow. So what did we find? Well, in the conditioning phase, not surprisingly, we had here the tense turned off and here the tense turned on. Well, the green fixation process was paired with a low intense pain stimulus. Well, when we did not give participants any explicit instructions, we didn't see any uh, placebo effect. So the implicit conditioning of this didn't work. Here we saw a placebo effect, but this can be accounted for by the explicit instructions that we gave people after the initial conditioning. So we thought, well, why do we not manage to implicitly condition our participants? So one idea that we had was that perhaps the on-off status of the tense is not sufficiently salient to participants. Then we also thought, well, perhaps the instructions are a bit too unspecific because we didn't really mention pain at all. And most importantly, we did not have a reference stimulus in the beginning prior to condition. So some participants could not really compare the test stimulus after conditioning with what they had experienced before. They underwent the tense supposed the purported um, tense field. And lastly, we figured, well, perhaps the difference in pain intensity between the tense on and off is too salient. I can go back. Here we have a very low painful stimulus and a very high painful stimulus. Perhaps the difference was too salient. So what we did is we um, changed our design. We uh, presented a picture of the tense on and off on the monitor rather than, a rather than just a fixation plus. We changed the instructions. We introduced a baseline with a reference stimulus and we changed the classical conditioning so that the difference between tense on and off was less salient. So how that did it look? So rather than fixation plus, participants now saw a photo of the <clears throat> tense device being on, turned on, so the display is lightened up. And this was the photo of the tense um, device turned off. We changed the instructions. So this is, we, we simplified the instructions a bit in order not to confuse participants. And the most important um, change was that we now were more specific and we stated these electromagnetic impulses can affect one's pain sensations. Therefore, it is important that you closely monitor your pain sensations. Again, we did not specify in what direction, but at least we focused participants' attention to whether they would experience pain and what would be the pain intensity. So this is how the design looked. We again had a heat pellet heat pain calibration phase. We have the implicit instructions that I just showed you. Then we introduce this baseline or reference phase where participants either received um, the later test stimulus as a reference stimulus here, 
or they did not receive any test or reference stimulus. Then we had the conditioning phase with the difference in pain intensity between tens being turned on and off, only being three rather than six on the BIS um, as in the initial experience. And then we tested participants. And what did we find? Well, when participants had no reference things, no baseline stimulus, conditioning again, a success, which is not really surprising, but we did not have any placebo effect. When they had a baseline or reference stimulus, then we, we, then we got a placebo effect. So this certainly points out that we need, or participants need to have some kind of reference in order to sort of change their pain perception depending on the placebo treatment that we are um, delivering. Another question that came up when we sort of looked at our data was perhaps in the first experiment, the intensity of the tense device being turned off was too high um, because it was eight. Um, and perhaps that also makes difference depending on the severe, the intensity of the pain stimulus, stimuli that you apply during conditioning. So this is now an explicit conditioning design. Again, heat pain calibration. We had a reference phase in both cases. Oops, but here the difference is that we had one group receiving um, pain stimulus with an intensity of five. Oops, oops, oops. wrong direction. Um, with eight. And then we had the second group with a um, baseline or reference stimulus with an intensity of five. Then we had the conditioning phase. Here in the first group, um, the difference in both groups being three on the intensity scale, but here between eight and five, and here between five and two. And this was a test phase. So here in the second group, the intensity of five, so moderate intensity, and here high intensity. And again, the participants were explicitly instructed how the tense when being turned on would affect their pain intensity. <clears throat> so what we did we find? Well, when we use the high intensity test stimulus and reference stimulus, we did not find a placebo effect. However, when we use the moderate intensity reference, and again, during the conditioning phase, the difference between tense being turned on and off was always three. It was just a difference in the pain intensity um, one in one group being high and in one group being moderate, uh, but we only saw the placebo effect in the moderate intensity uh, reference and test stimulus. So this is the first case example um, when we try to sort of come up with a design um, combining implicit and explicit conditioning. And what we learned is that it's important to have um, test and reference stimuli and that the intensity of the pain stimuli really makes a difference aside from the fact that we also changed the instructions. Now, the second part, um, we were interested, we are interested in also testing placebo and nocebo effects in children and adolescents. And this is certainly a particular challenge because you need to have um, safety in, you need to take into account safety measures, for example. Um, and we also need to take into account that in children and especially young children and adolescents, we have a much larger uh, variability. So we need to use a within subject design rather than a between group design because uh, if we use a between group design, we need a really great number of participants in order to um, detect any between group differences. So what I'm now presenting is our pilot studies um, where we try to initially validate this new experimental design in adults for later use in children. Since our idea was to later use this um, experimental design in children and adolescents, we thought or we came up with the idea um, of a novel treatment design device that would be plausible 
um, for children in that it modulates pain in either direction, either when it's turned on, it can reduce pain, or when it's turned off, it can, uh, when it's turned on, but with a different um, um, activity, then the pain, in, pain is increased. We had to develop a wristband, and here you see some LED. So when the LEDs were green and was combined with vibration, that was supposed to reduce pain. If the LED lights were red, combined with the vibration, the pain was supposed to be increased. And we developed a cover story in order to um, make it possible that such a device really exists. Um, again, with this is very professional box, and we also have a booklet explaining why for some clinical conditions it's actually important to increase pain support. And um, if the device is turned off, no light, no vibration, no modular, modulatory influence. So, so this was one idea with the wristband to make it perhaps also for children very engaging because they know wristbands and they know what wristbands perhaps can do. A second um, difference was that we used uh, an apparatus that we developed, especially for young children, um, that allows heat pain stimulation, but such that we have a safety precaution. So the hand is not, or the arms not fixated, but the arm can be withdrawn. So let's say someone doesn't understand the instruction and it's beginning getting too hot then automatically the withdrawal reflex will be elicited. So you see that here, here's the thermoid mounted in an armrest. You can move the thermoid in this um, side, oops, direction. And um, this is also electronically controlled so that we know that the arm lies on the um, contact thermoid so that we know that the simulation is adequate. With this device, we can behaviorally measure pain tolerance because we can measure the, the withdrawal latency. Let's say we say or instruct people to say, well, remove your hand if you don't, if you no longer tolerate it. Then we can measure um, the time or the temperature um, when the person is withdrawing their arm. And this is a temperature increase, one degree uh, per second, starting at 32 degrees Celsius. Um, so our idea was initially, well, in order not to make the experiment too long, we thought, well, perhaps we can combine the placebo and the placebo trials, because we explained to subjects if the um, wrist is turned on and the lights are green, then pain is reduced. If the wristband is turned on, lights are red, then pain is increased. And if it's turned off, no change in pain. And these are the stimulus intensities that we use. We use here for the placebo pain for minus two degrees, for placebo pain for plus one degree. And when the um, wristband was turned off, pain special. We chose a threshold because for labor use in children and adolescents, we cannot go to the intensities that you can usually um, administer when you um, test um, adults. So this is the design. So we first had the determination of the pain threshold and the baseline, then the verbal expectation manipulation. Again, this is really here. Uh, the combination of explicit instructions plus conditioning. Then we had a second baseline phase for the tolerance measure. And our idea was in the test phase, we actually tested the pain tolerance because we hypothesized that the experience here of pain reduction or pain increase would in some ways generalize to the pain tolerance. Because you have here experience well when the green, when the wristband is turned on, green, it hurts less. If it's turned on and it's red, then it hurts more. So this was the test phase. And what did we find? Well, in the conditioning phase, what we would expect, we have the difference between the placebo intensity 
placebo enhancing the control, but in the test phase, no difference, no placebo effect, no placebo. This, these are here just the results for the subjective pain ratings, um, but it looks similar for the behavioral than measured pain tolerance. So, well, well, you can imagine this was really disappointing. So what we, then we, we sort of went thinking and actually we had asked the participants how, whether they believed the wrist, um, that the wrist then would, for example, change their um, pain experience. We had some participants report, for example, that the color light did not match the perceived effect. Some participants actually believe that during the test phase, the lights were switched. So the green light would now mean it hurts more and the red light would mean it hurts less. Some participants reported that the vision wasn't active even though the lights were on. So we basically um, deceived them. We also figured perhaps mixing the placebo and placebo trials has been or was too confusing for our participants. We did it in the past. Hmm? We've done that. Yeah. yeah. And then perhaps the behavioral tolerance measure prolonged the duration of the experiment. Nice time. <clears throat> yes. Did you test for uh, individual pain sensitivity? Well, we adjusted the pain threshold in videos. So this was not this was not on um, the same temperature for every participant. And you use the same proportion. Yes. Yes. Who else are the experimental? What? The experimental. Who ran this experiment? Ah, here. <laughs> That's maybe that is. <laughs> well, we actually had different uh, experiments, but it wasn't always the same. Because we had some people in the lab, no matter what they were doing, they were not as in the. And that's also from Germany. So. <laughs> <laughs> And the contingency is there, I mean, like yeah. lights and stimulations. Yes. Yes. And so then what we did next was we shortened the instructions and simplified them because we figured that they are too complicated. Uh, but again, our idea was not really to test adults. It was basically just pilot testing uh, in order to be able to use it in a children and adolescents. Um, so we figured perhaps it's not salient enough if uh, just the lights on the wristband go on, but we also have to sort of present it on the monitor. Um, we also figured perhaps it's, especially also for the children, it might be better to separate the placebo and the placebo phase. And we shortened um, the design by basically just focusing on the subjective pain intensity as primary output. So how does it look? We This is a trial. So we had the inter-trial interval of black screen now with the visual cue. This was a photo of the wrist. And again, green lights meaning pain relief, red lights meaning pain increase. Then the heat simulation began together with the vibration of the wristband. And then we had the pain rating. And this is the sequence. So we had one group receiving first the placebo manipulation and then the placebo manipulation and the other group the other way around. Um, and we, the, these are the same stimulus intensities as in the study before. So we had but the placebo stimulus pain for minus two degrees and the placebo uh, plus, one degree, uh, plus one degree Celsius and the control stimulus the pain, the control, control stimulus meaning that um, the wrist pain was turned off. Well, again, <laughs> almost the picture perfect. Um, we had even in the baseline trials, same intensity. We saw the conditioning in the placebo trials, in the first block and the second block, also the placebo effect. When we look at the test phase, well, not really what we would expect. Then we thought, well, perhaps this is intermingled with the sequence effect. 
So we analyze the data. This is on the left side, you see the data for the placebo, on the right side for the SIBO. And um, the first figures are always, um, for example, the placebo in the first phase or the placebo in the first phase, no difference. Well, we got a placebo effect, but only in the group which had first undergone the placebo training. It's a contrast. And if one really interprets this difference, one could speculate, perhaps we also see a slight placebo effect, but again, only when the placebo phase came after the placebo phase. So, well, we went to a the beginning of the group and we asked, um, well, perhaps they can help us. So one, a couple of ideas that we had was perhaps the simultaneous presentation of the cube, the photo on the monitor, the wristband vibrating being its turn on, and the heat stimulus might have been too confusing, sensory interference. So the idea was, well, perhaps we, may, we, do, we, inter, we put a delay in between the presentation of the cube, then the wristband, so sort of the treatment begins, and then the heat stimulation begins. We also figured perhaps participants might not have paid sufficient attention to the wristband effect. And also they might have expected the same effect in each trial. So we instructed the, uh, we changed the instruction a bit um, and focused a little bit more that there might be a variation from trial to trial. And a third idea was perhaps the placebo stimulus intensity was too low because it was actually below pain threshold. And then the placebo stimulus intensity was perhaps also a bit too low because it only um, was one degree above pain threshold. So we changed the stimulus intensities. So we had um, the placebo intensity, now the pain threshold, placebo intensity pain uh, threshold plus 1.6 degrees, and the, oops, and the control stimulus in between, sorry. Okay, so this is how it looked. This, was, this is the uh, trial structure in pilot study one and two. So we have the inter-trial interval, the visual cue, the simultaneous um, heat pain stimulation and the turned on wristband and the pain rating. So this is now the new design, inter-trial interval, visual cue, an inter-trial interval. So the wristband already was turned on here together with the visual cue, sort of treatment starts. And then the heat pain stimulation occurred and then um, the participants waited um, their pain. Up, oh, what did we get? Uh, again, conditioning <laughs> looks good. No placebo effect. Well, a bit of placebo effect, but um, sort of being informed about our sequence effect in the first or in the second pilot study, we analyzed the data also depending on sequence. And well, again, we only saw the placebo effect in the group um, who had received the placebo um, intervention after the placebo first, but not um, in the first phase. When they have received the placebo in the first phase or placebo, there was no effect. And again, one might think perhaps there's also some difference here, uh, but again, only when the um, participants underwent the placebo intervention after the placebo intervention. Well, and this is where we are right now. I don't have a solution for you right now um, because we sort of stepped back and thought perhaps we have to rethink fully again. So um, I want to summarize what we have learned from these um, series of experiments. One important um, for us was um, that implicit and probably also explicit conditions it requires at least a prior or a concurrent experience, experience with the reference stimulus because for, otherwise it's for participants very difficult um, to sort of gauge their later pain experience in the test phase. What we also noted was when, even when we explicitly condition participants, the intensity of the control of the reference stimulus and related test stimulus should be moderate in order to demonstrate the placebo effect if it's too high. Um, even um, if the conditioning is successful, we don't, um, we don't get 
of the chances are not good that you get a placebo effect. Um, and perhaps at least when we use such a perhaps plausible clinical device, such as a wristband, it is really difficult to induce, induce a placebo and nocebo effect by mixing placebo and nocebo condition. I know that you have shown this, but we here, uh, failed here. Um, and when we, our idea of these consecutive phases, that sort of comes with new problems because now we have the risk of sequence effects. And um, well, when I put, when we look at the wristband experiment, even when explicit conditioning, we showed successful learning. This was always working, but this just did not necessarily result in a placebo and placebo effect. Perhaps it depends on the plausibility of the device. We asked participants that, and there was no real strong data that they didn't find the device plausible. And um, what we also learned, I've shown at least one example that instructions are really crucial and slight changes in wording can really make a difference. So I gave you some <laughs> ideas of our work under construction. And sometimes we can relax and we find a solution, but sometimes we don't. And I wish you would laugh with your experience. Mm -hmm.